welcome back. I'm Connie Sogel, your host of Call to Create, and I am so excited about our guests today for a very particular reason. In fact, it was so funny that we just, before we started, I like to have a prayer before we begin. And isn't it a beautiful thing when you're interviewing two chaplains? It's like, anybody feeling it for prayer? And I'm like, okay, that's kind of a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> we have Don Dimick and Jenna Carson today, and I'm so excited to have them share with you about being the first female chaplains in their realm and also their experience about being female chaplains and answering your question, what is that and what do they do? So welcome, Don and Jenna. So happy to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. you. So great. Oh my gosh. There's so many things. And when I've read up on them and what I actually did was actually read an article in the church news, Jenna, about you first. And that's when we started digging and saying, oh, this is so good. We've got to spotlight this. Like, let's get some more information on this. So I'm going to give you their official bios, but then we're going to jump in to the who, what, why, where, how, all the things about this particular realm, which is so not well known. And yet it's just so impactful. So let's begin with Don. Chaplain Don Dimmick enlisted in the Army Reserve in 2013 at the age of 17. Is that right? Yes. Oh my goodness. I can't wait. And on a prayer and in need of money for school. She later received undergraduate degrees from Utah State University in international studies and religious studies with minors in Russian and military science. She went on to receive a master's degree in chaplaincy from Brigham Young University and now happily serves the soldiers of 617 Aviation Combat Support Unit in Fort Carson, Colorado as their chaplain. Her major interests include women's religious experience, interfaith work, yoga, poetry, and a good thrift store find. Amen, sister. All right. Welcome, Don. And for Jenna, Chaplain Captain Jenna Carson is a chaplain and officer in the United States Air Force. She's also an emerging writer who is writing her first book, a memoir about her time working as a prison chaplain. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. She currently serves as chaplain at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, where she provides spiritual care for airmen, guardians, Marines, and sailors. She earned a BA from Brigham Young University and a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School. While beginning her chaplaincy training in graduate school, Jenna began petitioning church leadership to change policy and allow women to serve as military chaplains. She would become the first female military chaplain endorsed by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Prior to serving in the Air Force, she worked as a hospital and prison chaplain. Welcome, ladies. Oh, let's unpack this. There's just so much good stuff. Let's kind of first establish what a chaplain is so everybody's on the same page. I mean, we kind of have visions of Father Mulcahy, you know, from MASH, if you're back in the day. You know, so kind of you both had that military and hospital experience. So kind of in one or two sentences, can you help us understand what is a chaplain and what do they do and what can they not do? Either one of you want to start. Jenna, I'm looking at you. Yep. <laughs> well, I'm I'm a little emotional right now as you read those bios. I'm just so touched that Don and I get to do this work, and it's been such a journey for both of us. And so that's why I have tears in my eyes right now. They're happy <laughs> tears. Um, chaplains, we get to support people in all walks of life. And oftentimes when people walk into our office or when we encounter them elsewhere, they are in the worst moment of their life. They are struggling. They are searching for answers, searching for meaning. They might have just been through a very significant loss. And we get to provide spiritual care. And that can look like so many different things because we're working with people from all different kinds of backgrounds. Could be faith centered could not we might be working with people who identify as humanists atheists who don't believe in a higher power or we might be working with someone who's had faith in a higher power from a very young age and so it's so amazing that we get to meet people where they are and be someone to what we call hold space for them in whatever moment they're going through seeking counsel from a chaplain. And there's a lot more to that, but Don, I'll, I'll let you add. It's beautiful. Don, what would yeah. you like to add? Beautifully said. My first thought, the easiest way for me to explain it is off of our core competencies. So the Army Chaplain Corps has three things, nurture the living, care for the wounded, and honor the fallen. Ooh. I feel like everything I do falls into one of those categories. To Jenna's point, like a lot of Nurturing the living, it, you mean it's the whole gambit. It's as unique as the person's life experiences and what they're going through and how we support them. So really it's about like walking alongside for me, providing healing, offering healing, pointing them to the, the source of healing as appropriate, right? 
but walking alongside them as I'm on my own journey. <laughs> so that's nurture the living and then care for the wounded. We do a lot of like funerals, gravesite services. We do trainings. Like we just did a training yesterday for like when we're in a combat environment, what that looks like when there's mass casualties, you're providing like last rites and circulating in that way. So that's, that's another role and honor the fallen. So that those kind of go hand in hand. What that seems to me is you are just with human life in their most vulnerable and tender experiences. Wow. And what a Jane of all trades you need to be to be able to pull out that tool belt and say, what do they need in this particular moment? So I want to come back to that in a little bit of what that skill set requires. I want to go to the moment. This is such a unique thing. And ironically, both of you have felt, even on your missions, you felt this rumble of something in the future. And then all these steps along the way, these stepping stones of so people listening that kind of feel these different feelings sometimes of I should be doing X, Y, Z, but that doesn't make any sense. Or I should maybe follow this path, but that just seems so illogical. Let's go to those experiences that you both had of just feeling drawn. I know, Don, you started feeling some of that early on. And, and Jenna, it was actually a mentor that kind of started suggesting maybe a path for you that hadn't even decided or even considered. Let's start with Don this time. I felt like God was patiently persistent with me. It's not what I felt inclined towards at the beginning. I didn't know a lot about it. I hadn't seen a female in that role for sure. I just saw men who preached. And so I was like, that's not really for me. But it, it took a couple of years of figuring out what a chaplain was more and God pressing on my heart and saying like, I'm preparing you for this thing. But I initially felt drawn and called on my mission. That's amazing. I know Jenna, at first you were like, divinity school what is that do you want to take us to what how that was for you right so I didn't know what a chaplain was because as Don said we're, we're just not in that culture especially in the church we're not used to having paid ministers right and so I first felt called to ministry I think at an early age but it was on my mission where I felt a strong impression to come back to BYU finish my schooling and then go to graduate school and it was then that a mentor was like have you thought of Harvard Divinity School I didn't know what Divinity School was but you know the spirit just said yes it was like a big green light and so that was when I learned what a chaplain is and does and it was so exciting to me. It felt like exactly what I wanted to do. And the surprise was that I felt called to military chaplaincy. And at the time, I had no idea how hard it would be to get to this point. Um, and I thought it would be a matter of just calling church headquarters and explaining, you know, I, I feel called from God to do this. So I'm seeking your endorsement. And so our listeners should know that the first step in becoming a military chaplain is to get endorsement from your church or organization. And so that's the battle that Don and I had is because our church had only ever endorsed men because men are ordained in our religion. And so that was something that I thought would be an easy fix, just explaining that this came from my higher power. This was a higher calling, but it turned out to be a years long effort to eventually get to the policy change that allowed Don and I to, to serve. <laughs> That is amazing. And I can't wait to talk a little bit more about what that process was because they've been doing that for over a century, right? With the men being ordained. But I'm sure this was a whole new door for everybody to step into and how beautifully that everybody did step into that. And that now there is this opportunity when people feel so called and probably didn't make sense to either of you. Now you served a mission in Russia, Don, right? And you served a mission in Florida. How did your missions you felt those rumbles on there. How did your mission kind of prepare you for that? Not in a cliche way, but really mm -hmm. truly for you. How did that prepare you for serving as a chaplain? Did it give you some, some skill sets? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I always say I was a bad missionary because I, I was not in the numbers game and that's changed a lot now. But when I went on my mission, there was a lot of focus on like, how many people are we talking to? How many people are getting baptized? And my heart was always in, wow, I just want to learn about people. And it, I felt the sacredness of sitting with people and talking about God in, in a curious way, not, and I have something to offer you that you must accept way. It was like, what do you, what, what do you have to give me as well? It was very reciprocal. And I learned how to sit with people through that and how to ask questions. It cultivated that curiosity in me. 
I love how you said that you learned how to sit with people and that is such a driver for you. It seems like being able and both of you to sit with people's stories, not try to solve it, not try to give them platitudes or like how to's or you shoulds, but just being able to sit with them in their story, their experience and feel nurtured and comforted. Like someone is there with them through it. Mm -hmm. Jenna, what about for you with your mission? You know, I was not as spiritually mature as Dawn on my mission. <laughs> I was very rigid. Like I was extremely concerned about people's salvation. And so I actually took that a lot into my body and was stressing myself out and getting really sick. I was so worried that if people didn't accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I was doing something wrong or that, you know, they'd be missing their chance. And my theology around that and my understanding of that has totally changed. And don't get me wrong, like I'm sure I was able to serve and, and hopefully lift people on my mission, but ministry for me now is not having an agenda, not trying to convert, not trying to change people's view, but just to support them in their journey. And so I'm so grateful that I had that kind of rigor of the mission and now can kind of just literally in the moment with people breathe into the moment, relax and realize God's got this. In my theology, we are all in God's hands and wherever we are on the journey is exactly where we need to be. <laughs> I love that so much. You're talking about all different kinds of walks of life, different faiths, all of those things. What are some of the skills that you've been able to employ in those situations? Are you able to reach people? What kind of skills do you draw on? This is a line that Brother Corey Brower in a church talk years ago in my home ward in Idaho gave. He is an enlightened being. <laughs> and he just kept saying, I don't know, but the Lord knows. And so when I am in sessions with people and I have no idea how to help them and support them, no idea what to say, I just pray in my mind, Lord, I don't know, but you know, please help me know what to say, what not to say. And as I calm down and listen and be still and know that God is God, the answers come. Mm, beautiful. Dawn? Yeah. I would add, it's so co-creative. We talk about this a lot. Like, I think that there are skill sets, like in my setting apart, one of the things was like, God was going to use all the talents and skills that he's given you since you were a girl to bear in this great calling. That's a line that like I hold dear. So there's specific things where I'm like, Okay, I'm more introverted by nature. So initiating contact kind of related to mission question. I had to learn how to do that, like to just go up to people and, you know, just hang out with them or ask how they're doing those sorts of things, which the humility, the being in the presence of God all help, right? It's the confidence in God um, that comes through. There are specific things I think Jen and I both do that we, <laughs> we have cultivated skills that you have to have as a chaplain, like sensitivity, discernment, and then to Jenna's point, the overarching and underlying and in between of all of that is how do I invite somebody into the presence of God and get out of the way of that? It's not necessarily about the skills I contribute. It's about God shining through my weaknesses. <laughs> I love how you shared about that discernment, because I would imagine that you've got this tool belt and in any situation, you've got to instinctively, intuitively, I would say by the spirit, know what does this person need to hear? And what is it that God knows about this person and the, the way they need to hear something? So the fact that you have this intuition as well as this gift of discernment, I, I would love to kind of jump to have you noticed a difference, and I mean in a positive way, between male and female chaplains? Not saying that one is better than another, just saying, have you seen the need for the differences in that? We're smirking because the answer is yes. It's <laughs> um, I, I think I've been taught over time through the people that I minister to and walk alongside with of the need for more female chaplains, probably on the monthly, somebody's like, you're the first female chaplain I've met. And I feel comfortable talking to you because I want to talk to a man or be emotional with a man in this way. And it's not the case for everybody. Right. But having access to somebody who would make you feel comfortable where you can let that guard down and have a safe space is important. And more female chaplains, like that, we are that for a lot of people. I love how you bring that up. I, I would imagine there's that benefit of being able to have the choice so that whatever you're feeling, you're able to get the help that you need. Jenna? 
Yes, I agree with what Don said. And it's interesting because a lot of the times when people are seeking a woman chaplain, it's because in my experience of sexual assault or considering family planning, or I've been approached about abortion, I've been approached about um, motherly kind of issues like people's relationship with their mom. And sometimes people truly are more comfortable coming to a woman. And I've been surprised because I came in thinking that mostly the people who would come to me would be women, but I'm really surprised at how many men want to talk to a woman chaplain as well. I work a lot with young people who have just enlisted and just gotten out of boot camp. They're in technical school training. And a lot of times I just feel this like motherly instinct. And I, I'm not saying that a chaplain is a mother or a mother is a chaplain, but I, I find a lot of parallels there. Absolutely. It's that nurturing, suckering, comforting, I would imagine. And I think you bring up such a good point with being able to move into those different roles and fulfill those roles, knowing that you're just there to help them in that moment, right? You're not replacing anybody or anything like that. You're there in that moment. Let's talk about being women in this male arena. I really don't want to go off on stereotypes and things like that, but I would love to talk about the realities that you've dealt with and what tools have you gained in knowing how to navigate that for listeners that are listening that are first in their arenas and also particularly women who are coming into maybe male dominated areas, business, filmmaking, things like that, where there's a lot of men and typically men have let out and done those things. How can you navigate that arena with being able to build those bridges of respect and, and being able to be colleagues? Any thoughts on that? One of the big ones is the importance of, so this is not navigating necessarily that tension, but outside of it is surrounding yourself with support networks, with other women, places where you can process what that's like and having mentors in that way. And another piece that I've been learning this past year, especially is that it's not a kindness not to hold people accountable. And so I have developed the confidence and and desire to walk through those things with men to educate. I think I've been silent for a long time. Like, I think we do this. We're like, oh, if something affects us. We just kind of like table it away or shoulder it or share it with just another woman maybe, or I never go to the person about it. You know, that I was, I felt wrong in this way or felt excluded. This just happened to me last week. And I had a peer check with somebody. Hey, like I was literally in the room saying like, Hey, can I, I want to help too. Like everybody else was included. All the male chaplains, but not me. And I'm like, literally sitting here going like, please include me. And so I did a little bit of a peer check, right? Is this just me that's feeling this way? Well, no, I noticed that too. I was like, well, let me talk to, to this individual because we work together and I want us to have a good relationship. And so I've taken on this head first. I'm just going to, in kindness and grace and love, like, I want us to have a good relationship and I respect you. And I just want the same respect in return. And it's gone well so far. It's a totally different way of being in the world than what I'm used to, but it feels right. So I, I'm enjoying living in that space and just kind of trusting that healthier relationships come out of it rather than hurt relationships. And I so appreciate the way that you approached that, which was very Stephen Covey, right? Seeking for understanding, very win-win. You may not have recognized how this kind of went down, but here's some food for thought. And I would love to be able to have this better way of communicating because we work together and that's such a great experience. I love that. And having some of those experiences myself, so often it's just a lack of understanding. There's a lack of awareness of how things are going down because there's just been a pattern. It's just been something that's been followed. So I really appreciate that way of going about it. And I know that there are situations that are trickier than that and that oh, they yeah. really that, that I know that there are lots of different layers and levels, but I love that, especially first layer, first level. That's so good. Jenna. I second what Don said, holding people accountable. I'm very fortunate right now. My entire team and my leadership are very good at treating women equally. And I don't feel like a second class citizen in my current chaplain core team, but it's interesting how deeply ingrained it is for young people to turn to the male in the room and think that he's the chaplain. And so I'll be wearing my uniform and in a room about to give a briefing to a hundred students who've just come out of boot camp, and they'll pass by me and look at the man standing next to me in civilian clothes. Someone literally asked him, are you the chaplain? He's like, mm -hmm. no, I'm not even in the military. <laughs> 
But things like that just shock me. I mean, this is the young generation, like 18 year olds, right? And I, I took off my chaplain hat and put on my officer in the United States Air Force hat. And I was raising my voice and telling these young students that they needed to step it up because they had walked by me and looked at my male colleague and called him sir and completely ignored me. And in the military, when you see an officer, you say, good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. But they completely ignored me and acknowledged him. And he was furious. This was a a different scenario. This was a chaplain colleague of mine. And he looked at me, he's like, Chaplain Carson, we are going to address this. And so both he and I went in the room and he started yelling at the kids. And then I said, you are in the United States Air Force. You will do better than this. I said, it is extremely disrespectful to not acknowledge a woman officer. And so at times like that, I sometimes feel guilty after for calling it out, but we really do mm. need to pull it out because it's so deeply embedded. The patriarchy is truly ingrained. And so it can be exhausting, but truly part of my work is educating and reminding. Yeah. Look at the woman in the room. Oh, that's such a good phrase. Look at the woman in the room. And I would even add, look at the ethnicity in the room because yes. there's minorities that feel that same way, right? And we're, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole, but I love that there is a turning of this flywheel on all levels of these things have needed to shift and they're shifting now. And I would say even the reverse. I was in a business meeting. I'm in a presidency in a, a business um, organization. And I noticed that there was a very strong couple of personalities. And every time I would try to speak up, I just yielded. And that's what women tend to do. We just yield and we sit back and we're like, I tried two, three times and now I'm done. Mm -hmm. and right after that meeting, the other, he was in line to be president, president elect. He called me and he said, do you have a minute? Are you, are you open to some feedback? I mean, just like that. And I said, absolutely. What do you got? And he said, you stand and speak in front of all these different people in these organizations and you're fabulous, but you get in a meeting and you shrink. And he mm -hmm. said, it's not okay. You've got to step into it. And I said, I just get shut down. And he's like, what are you going to do about it? right? It was such a good challenge. And we have such a respect for each other. I knew what he was saying, which is you can do it differently and you don't need to be apologetic. And that shifted everything for me. So I love that you are pioneering that in that realm. I know lots of people are pioneering in a lot of different industries and all of that flywheel turning is making a difference. I so appreciate it because that's hard knocks at the beginning. I remember mm -hmm. Sherry you talking about being a CEO in um, Desiree book and how she paved the way in Laurel Day talked about how much Sherry Dew had paved the way for when she became CEO and what a gift that was. So we do that. We give that gift to each other. Any other thoughts on that? I just want to add one thing as you're talking about how deeply embedded it is um, in our own spheres, we can influence and hold people accountable, but the importance of really holding space for one another outside of it. Because I walked into a chaplain training and I was talking with a female religious affairs specialist. And when she went to like break contact with me, she referred to me as sir. And she caught herself and felt so embarrassed. And there were other chaplains in the room that just witnessed this happen. And that's the piece where I just have to stay grounded in who I am, hold grace for people, hold people accountable. And let God do the rest. I embody Christ. I want people to see Christ in my countenance more than anything, because some people respond well, like my male colleague friend, like responded well when I addressed it with him. Others might not. And the approach is more so like, well, you can't deny my ministry. You can't deny the person that I am. Right. And, and the forgiveness that I continue to extend, like they feel that those are my lingering thoughts. Jenna. <laughs> I, I love that and really quick. If I can just say, I love that line that you said, whole grace and hold people accountable. And we can do those two things, two sides of a coin. They're not, not compatible. Th those are two things. And we see that in parenting, in business, in religious entities, that in religious experiences in the church. I just think that's such a great line. Jenna. I love that, Don. And I also have been called sir. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, <but laughs> yeah. yeah, a couple of times. And at least they're trying to be respectful, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it just, again, it shows how ingrained it is. But one additional thought I had, Connie, was even before the military, I was in a men's prison and then even the church in so many ways is a male dominated structure. And so I think I've spent so many years feeling like I need to match the qualities and energy level of the men kind of be like them. And I, I don't think I was consciously doing that, but subconsciously and I do in my personal life, a lot of work of like reconnecting with what I conceptualize as the divine feminine and the feminine energy in myself. 
And so when I'm at home, when I'm recovering from my day of work, taking the uniform off, I'm coming into a place of, for me, it's like a spiritual softness and a very feminine place. And yesterday I was doing this exercise where I was imagining a healing light coming over my body. And I was visualizing myself in a safe place. And my place is on the Oregon coast, overlooking the ocean, bare feet in the soil. But it was so interesting because in this visualization of myself, I've never had this before. I visualized myself wearing this long flowy dress, a crown of flowers on my head, about as far away as you can get from a military. military. And I was pregnant and it was so interesting. I don't know what prompted that, but because I haven't carried a baby to full term, I've miscarried before, but I think the pregnancy was a symbol. It was a symbol of the woman, the motherhood that just is me, whether or not I'm ever a biological mom. And, and I thought how powerful that image is. And I, I know I will keep coming back to that. Like when I'm deployed, when I'm in hard times, when I'm facing a lot of discrimination and difficulty and feeling pressure to be more, quote, masculine and aggressive, I think I'll keep coming back to that image. <laughs> so. Yes, that is gorgeous. Don, any thoughts on that? Yeah, a little bit of a twist on that. I think part of the season I'm in related to showing up fully and, and inserting myself into my workspace has been how do I incorporate the feminine into work more and challenge people to enter that with me? It's like my office has a lot more feminine imagery than your average chaplain office, including like tree, you know, like a beautiful tree tapestry and things like that. And the activities that we do are in nature. I'm doing yoga up at the airfield soon. So inviting that and seeing people who will respond to that and, and just kind of staying open to what that looks like. But then to answer your question, coming home, Jenna and I are very similar in this way of the yoga, the meditation, the visualizations and being in nature. I'm blessed in Colorado to have the mountains right here and I live by a creek. So I spend a lot of time for me in the presence of God in nature, in meditation, in scriptural texts, in women's texts. And I just go and sit in churches sometimes as I was thinking about this, I was like, just like going and sitting in a cathedral is healing in a lot of ways for me. So those are some of the practices that I do. So good. So good for any of us to do, especially when you're dealing with as creatives, you're putting in so much to your expression that you can kind of just get empty at the end or just, and then you go home to a family or come out of your studio and it's phase two. So you've got mm -hmm. to make this shift, that switching of the gear. And that I love that you brought in bringing in the feminine and not hiding that or keeping that away of getting people more uh, acclimated to that, being able to help people tap into that in a safe way and in a way that feels like it normalizes that experience. And that kind of leads me to a little bit, because I know we're kind of winding up on time, but that leads me into your inner faith pastors, right? You go in and you're working with all different backgrounds and things that we've mentioned. Do you find a common tool that's a go-to with people, or do you have sort of a way that you've learned to work with a variety of different people that is it's useful, is helpful? Like I said, people who don't believe at all or, or who maybe have had traumatic experiences, but they need help. Have you found some, some tools that generally work? Don mentioned this earlier, both she and I were trained in, in yoga, and so for me, I use a lot of mindfulness exercise, a lot of breathing exercises in individual sessions and also as a group. I have a weekly Mindful Monday class, which is some gentle yogic movements and a lot of meditation and visualization. It's really creating a safe space for people. When people, whether it's individual or in a group, can start to deepen the breath, calm the nervous system, get out of fight or flight mode and into a rest and digest mode, they can start to process things, feel safe and hopefully learn tools to find greater safety in their life. And that works I believe universally, no matter what religion, whatever your background, there are very few cases in which mindfulness isn't a good idea. Maybe when someone is like in psychosis, right? But generally that is a tool that is a game changer in my work. So good, Don. Beautiful. The thought in my head is like, we have two years and one mouth for a reason. That quote, the biggest thing for me is I let people teach me what they need. So asking questions of compassion and curiosity works for everybody. 
right? <laughs> so I, that's kind of my go-to when engaging with somebody who's different than I. And then with the be belief systems, those, yeah, letting them tell me, like asking them questions about their belief, their practices. And in doing so, then it opens up the door for you to authentically share yours. Like you've given them space to show up fully and then I show up fully too. <laughs> That's beautiful. I love that. Ask questions of compassion and curiosity. That's perfect for parenting. That's perfect for business. Perfect for everything. So, so beautiful. I do want to touch on one other thing. And then I want to ask you about some experiences you may have had where you've seen the differences that this has made. But when Jenna, you were petitioning the church for this change in policy, what were some of the things you learned from that that were positives to learn about that experience? It, for some reason, it just made me think of in the Old Testament, I hope I'm saying it right, but the five daughters of Zelophehad and, and how it was this whole inheritance, the daughters were going to lose their inheritance because there wasn't a male person to continue the line. And then they petitioned and it went to Moses. But the way they went about it was just very diplomatic. It was very clear. And Moses took it to the Lord and then got the download. Yep, we need to change that law. It was just, that's what I thought of when I, when I read that. Were there anything that you learned through that experience that, that you would love to share? Yes. Don said this so beautifully earlier in our work as chaplains, step aside and let God shine. And there's a lot of ego just as humans, we're ego driven, and that's not necessarily a bad thing that allows us to survive. But I would often ask, and I still ask God, just melt my ego, God. It's, it's about you. It's not about me. And to be clear, over the years, I had a lot of anger. And so I went through a lot of practices of releasing anger and, and giving all of this to God. There were a lot of times in this journey where when I was being told no, and, and I know that Dawn knows what this is like too, because she was also asking and petitioning. There were so many times where it truly looked like this wasn't going to happen. And I remember these were dark nights of my soul. I would be crying out to God and writing down my dreams. And one night I literally wrote, God, I give these over to you. And frankly, my mother also helped a lot too. There were times over the years where I would come home and literally come into her arms and she would embrace me and tell me, Jenna, you are enough. You are enough. And so she was a great support as well. That cycle back of you are doing that same thing to others where you're just giving that sucker because sometimes there's things beyond our control. And there's also, and I know for myself in different situations, there's God's timing and there is God's compensation. And I love that you bring up that trusting God in the process because he knows everything and he knows when things need to happen and what needs to happen. And we get to put our foot forward and do everything in our power. And then he gets to magnify that and take that and do with it what he needs. So I love that beautiful attitude. And especially for our listeners, that if they are engaging in something that's unique and all the times that someone is a first in something, there are so many new ways of looking at things that we can be overwhelmed by that and, and have such unsure footing of what that can look like or what is it supposed to look like? And what if we make a mistake and now doing something new and now we have to backtrack? There's just so many layers. So I love this humility and this trust in the Lord and being able to say, I've done all I can do and I'm putting it on the altar and I'm continuing to be willing to do whatever I need to do. But I know this is in thy hands. So beautiful. Any last thoughts on that? I, I learned that I do really have authority to speak up. When I am receiving revelation and vision from God, I get to say that and own it and not apologize. During this process, I, I was in many ways very passive, calling church headquarters, talking to the person in charge, being told no, and kind of shrinking. And now in my life, I understand the authority God has given me, and that is a beautiful thing. And I think when women can step into that, and it's hard in our church because we're not used to being told and, and truly given opportunity to grow into, to lean into our spiritual authority, but that spiritual authority is real and it's directly from God. It is directly from God. And so I am, I just... I pray that all of us as women can know that we have equal authority to speak our revelatory experience to men. Sometimes our policies are wrong. 
And there was a lot of praying out to God and asking him, God, is this wrong that I want this? Do I want too much? Am I out of line? I mean, people were telling me I was out of line and that I needed to be happy with what, quote, the Lord had given me. And I knew it wasn't the Lord. I'm so grateful now that I have confidence to be able to speak out when I know that things are wrong. I think what's interesting too in that makes me immediately think of President Nelson, who has literally looked at every single policy in the church, shaken it out and said, why do we have this? Where did it originate? And, and what does the Lord think about it now? Right. I would love to kind of wrap up. I know we are so over, but I couldn't help it. This is such, like I said, I think we could talk for like two hours and not even scrape the surface. But I want to talk about the experiences that when you've been in those chaplain moments, what have you seen the impact in people's lives? And then you've been able to, through Heavenly Father's help, be able to help them in that moment. We talk about impact. Something I talk about with people a lot is like, how do we quantify what we do? We have that urge, like Jenna mentioned, the ego. Like we want to know that we have influence and impact. I've stopped looking for that, but I've been impressed and sustained and lifted up by those around me when they come back and tell me like I worked with a couple and there was a fair involved and I felt like it was way beyond me but the wife prayed and said we want to work with you and we did it in three or four months their marriage better than ever and so she taught me that I could do more than I was capable of and that was like wow there was impact in our interaction right like I would still say God did all the work right and we were conduits but I was a witness to that and then I, I had an interaction a couple of weeks ago with the Seventh-day Adventist soldier. And I asked him if he wanted to pray for us at the end of our counseling. And in his prayer, he thanked God for his sister in Christ and that he felt like I was being guided and doing his work. And that touched me, right? So there's, there's little touch points where it's like, I'm feeling sustained and uplifted and I know I'm having impact. I know that, but I try not to orient around it or need to quantify. And I think that's why it's tricky. Like you said, like chaplains are not in the business of wanting to go get numbers or <laughs> we're, we're there because we care about people. And so the biggest impact is like, I, I know that I'm pouring into people and, and inviting them to go to the source for healing and comfort. And that's enough. Oh my goodness. Jenna, any thoughts from you? I would just say something that's so incredible about being a chaplain for the department of defense is that we have 100% confidentiality, which is wild. I mean, I don't know of any other policy in the civilian world, anywhere else for any other chaplain where you can have 100% confidentiality. So people can tell us anything and we are not allowed to report it unless we have written consent from them. And so that means that our military members trust chaplains. Not all of them trust us, but many of them trust us and will come and tell us things. I, I can't tell you how many times someone has sat in my office and said, I have never told anyone else this ever chaplain. And we, with that great trust and that great responsibility, I truly believe we are helping save lives. We, we have people come to us who are on the verge of taking their life, who change their minds. And that doesn't always happen. It isn't always a happy ending, but we truly are saving lives and helping people remember who they are and remember how precious and loved they are. Beautiful. And especially in these situations, in a prison setting, in military, in combat, where you can get so disoriented with who you really are and remembering that and being able to separate that from the job that you're doing or the thing that you have to do that you may not even want to do, being able to still stay whole as a person. What a gift that you give to people on the daily. Honestly, this has been so fantastic. I hope our listeners have felt that too and being able to apply that to their own creative journeys of when they're pioneering things, when things are going south, when they're not seeing the success that they want to see and they have to keep staying grounded in themselves and seeking comfort and guidance from the source of healing. And that is Heavenly Father and the Savior to be able to keep staying on that path to be able to fulfill their creative path. Thank you so much. I'm just curious if people want to reach out to you, are they able to, I know you have Instagram, but what is the best way for them to reach out to you? And is there a possibility of them being able to connect with you as civilians? Absolutely. Hit me up on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. <laughs> I'm pretty easy to get a hold of, but I'm always happy to connect with people.
I love connecting with people as well. Probably the easiest way is my website, jennacarson.com. There's a contact me form and you can just send me an email and I'd love to be in touch. Mm, so wonderful and so accessible. Honestly, I just, I can't help but say this is just so savior-like. It's just so accessible. It's so nurturing, so without agenda. I'm just literally here for you. What can I do to help you to move forward in a more whole and happier way? What a job. Wow. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> Thank you. And for those listening, if you have enjoyed this interview, like I have, go back and listen to it again. It's so good. And also listen to the other beautiful interviews we have. Al Caraway, we have Dr. Stacey Taniguchi, we have Gerald Lund, we have speakers, writers, filmmakers, musicians, all of them, Truman Brothers, all the people who are sharing their highs, lows, and all the in-betweens and helping you fulfill your call to create your 